Technique 4. Dissolving the I. By. Samail Onweer. 1. Introduction. There are two reasons why the Universal Christian Gnostic Movement is joyful this Christmas, of the year 1964. Besides the festivities that are being held in the Sumum. Supremum Sanctuarium of the Sierra Nevada, there is also another very important event. Being held in the city of Cartagena de Indias, Republic of Colombia. The event held is the first Gnostic Congress. Many brave representatives of the Gnostic people have gathered. Together under the direction of the Avatar of the Aquarian Age, the Venerable Master. Samail Onweer. It was in this same city of Cartagena de Indias that the first cry for political independence in this country occurred many years ago. In the present day, this country, and all of humanity are under a different type of slavery, which is more binding and more oppressive than the one that our forefathers were under. Therefore, the Venerable White Lodge, by means of the Avatar of Aquarius, wants to hand to us the second part of a very Important message regarding these times in which we are living. We read in the Gospels. Know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John, 8, 32. This exact knowledge comes to life each time a brave human being breaks away. From the world and strives for self-realization. The truth that the Gospels are referring to. Is one that the enemies of purity and sanctification have not been able to refute. Since many years ago, philosophers and writers have asked themselves, what is the truth? In this Christmas message, the avatar of the Aquarian Age gives us concrete guidelines and ways to discover within us the truth that the Divine Rabbi of Galilee talks about. There are three major sins that separate us from divinity. First of all, the person who lies is sinning against the Father which is truth, and against the Ninth Commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Second, the person who hates is sinning against the Son, who is love, and against the first commandment of the law of God, which says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. St. John 13, 35 For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. St. Matthew 5, 46 And thirdly, the person who fornicates sins against the Holy Spirit, which is the sexual fire, the fountain of life, and sins against the sixth commandment, you shall not fornicate. That is why St. Paul says in I Corinthians 6:18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. That is why fornication is the worst of sins. It blocks us, it closes the door. That leads us to our own Christification. The door which we must enter is sex. Remember. That the Christ said to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life no man cometh unto thee. Father, but by me. St. John 14, 6. That is also why the ascent or the rising of the sacred fire or the Holy Spirit is reigned or determined by the merits of the heart. The dwelling of the Father is in the head, in the highest place. The house of the Son is in the middle, in the heart. The house or dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, which is the sexual fire, is in the coccygeal bones, the sacral bones, and right in front of the guarded entrance. 2 where Jehovah placed the angel with the sword of Lyrae, after throwing man out of paradise. Only the pure and chaste can really understand the Holy Bible and figure out the deep mysteries that it holds. It so happens that those who have never read it are the ones that come to refute what the Sixth Commandment has to say. They usually state, well, does not the Bible tell us to be fruitful and multiply, Genesis 1, 28. This quoted order was only given to Adam, and only according to the wisdom of Genesis. This event occurred when he had not yet been given a wife, a woman, and at an evolutionary stage when he was still an androgynous creature. The people who oppose the sixth commandment, you shall not fornicate, 
also do so because they are horrified with the idea that the whole world will become desolate, that life will come to an end. They repeat this argument to every Gnostic who is out, explaining to them the real meaning of the Sixth Commandment. Well, we only need to reply. These teachings are being given only to Gnostic people. Humanity is not going to come to an end because that is the reason why you are here, to reproduce yourselves like the rest of the creatures of the earth. Your women will have children with great pain, and at a great cost. However, we will choose from these children those who will be best for the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. People have cleverly disguised what the Sixth Commandment implies, and they even mistake the Sixth Commandment, you shall not fornicate, with the Ninth, you shall not commit adultery. Let us see what the encyclopedias have to say about the words adultery and fornication. Adultery comes from the Latin word adulterium, illegitimate, carnal copulation or union between man and woman, being one of them or both of them married. Also, the physical and consumed violation of conjugal fidelity by any which one of the two parties. Fornication comes from the Latin fornicatus, voluntary sexual intercourse generally forbidden by law, between an unmarried woman and a man, ESP, an unmarried man, CF. Adultery. According to these definitions, adultery and fornication are the very same thing. No wonder the scholars treat the religious as imbeciles. Regardless, adultery and fornication are not the same thing. If they were the same thing, then the Bible would have no reason to speak about adultery and the adulterous person in 25 different verses, and about fornication and the fornicator in 25 separate verses, and so on. These academic definitions of the two words make the scholars and the intellectuals to reject the commandment as it is, thus, this is how they reject the blood of the one lowly lamb. 3. They should study what the Bible has to say about the horrible vice of fornication in Leviticus, chapter 15, especially verses 16 and 18. This chapter explains very clearly the implication of this horrible vice of fornication. It declares that all people who have voluntarily or involuntarily lost their seed are impure until the night, abyss. Moreover, the very religious people who study the Bible refute it and say that those statements are from the Old Testament and that they are out of use. Yet, Christ said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one title, shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled, Matthew 5, 17,18. We should ask these religious people, why do you then accept the Ten Commandments and why do you accept the tithes from your congregation? Are these two not part of the Old Testament as well? Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 19 the dictionary defines the word kiss as follows, touching a person or a thing with the lips, contracting or dilating them softly, to manifest love, friendship, or reverence. Now we really wonder how would an intellectual man interpret the meaning of kiss if he was strolling with his lady friend and all of a sudden a complete stranger to both of them would come over and kiss her on the cheek. Would he interpret it merely by the definition of the dictionary or would he interpret it according to what he understood had just happened? Would they not make up their minds based on their own criteria, or would they follow the dictionary? We the Gnostics prefer to use the divine plan, and await what may be called a divine conception. Many times this occurs as in the case of Elizabeth, mother of John the Baptist, as told in the Bible. At the age of seventy years she bore a healthy son, whom later had to live in the desert and dress himself with the skins of animals. Non-Gnostic people use millions of sperms to reproduce themselves. We use our seed to give ourselves life and enlightenment, wisdom. And only with the use of one sperm we can have what we call sons of chastity. 
the people who love the vice of fornication allege that the woman suffers when the male does not ejaculate. Tell the M that our women do not suffer because they are initiates and that we have the advantage of knowing the two systems. That is why Master Samael says that if the demon Luzbal would have been completely conscious of what sin is, he would never have fallen. Observe, dear Gnostic friends, that women only lose one ovum each month and that the fornicating man willingly loses millions of his seeds during that length of time. It has been microscopically observed that women produce millions of ovum. 4. Notice how in most of the animal species the male has more beauty and brighter colors. But, in the human species we notice that it is the other way around. We also observe that. In the animal kingdom the male respects the female once she is pregnant and she will also refuse to come in contact with him. But fornicating men and women do not respect the laws of nature, and they do completely the opposite. Notice also that the woman is called the weaker sex, although she handles man at her own will. Yet, when he recuperates his lost chastity, he starts looking younger, he regains vigor and beauty just like the animals that man forces abstinence upon, in order to exploit them. When man recuperates his lost chastity, he also recuperates the wand of command, the stall of the patriarchs. He liberates himself from sex and dominates it. Our human seeds are nurtured by three basic foods, first of all, by what we eat, second, by what we breathe, and third, by what we think. This is why we have asked you to pursue wholesome health, by staying away from vices, separating yourselves from the sins of the flesh and practicing chastity in your thoughts, words and in actions. And do not forget that we ask this of you and not of outside people. That is why the Christ would say, Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feel, and turn again and rend you. Matthew 7 6. Observe, O Gnostic friend, how the humble farmer gathers what is most valuable from his fields, the seeds, and he leaves behind the straw to rot upon the earth. Do not be like the dwellers of the abyss, who take much care of their physical bodies and pile them with distinctions, prizes and honors, but who ignorantly destroy their own sexual organs and throw away and despise their own seed. That is why it is written, He that is wounded in the stones, or hath his privy member cut off shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Deuteronomy 23,1 They roll around during old age like an orange that has been squeezed and then trampled upon by all who pass. If men knew what they would lose by fornicating, instead of wearing a smile, they would cry. Do not be like the dwellers of the labyrinth. Dear Gnostic, because they disperse their sadness with liquor and body houses. Drink the wine of light, the liquor of mandrake, the liquor of the gods, so you may keep yourself heroic and rebellious against the evils of the world. Do not be like the biblical Esau who exchanged his birthright for a bowl of porridge. Do not be like Lot's wife, by turning your head to past attachments, or wanting to live among the painful tombs of memories. Do not think, O oh Gnostic, that it will be easy to take people out of the labyrinth. For that task we need humans of immaculate purity, reliable virtue and humans who have formed the Christ in their hearts. Nevertheless, you will be attacked by the enemies of the internal Christ, who want to hurt your honor. Notice that it seems odd to a child to talk about getting married. 5. It is because he still does not have the maturity to appreciate or debate on the matter that you are bringing up. The same thing happens with men who still lack spiritual maturity. When you talk to them about certain topics. If you talk to them about the doctrine of. Christification and redemption, they will treat you and see you as if you are demented. And they will unite to attack you. That is the same reason why the son of man was. Attacked and killed for preaching this doctrine. Do not be alarmed either if the book publishers oppose the selling and distribution of the Gnostic books and the publishers refuse to print them. 
there will come a day when they will ask and plead for these books. For the benefit of their business, and they will do so without any hesitation. All people have their own principles and their beliefs, which we respect. And amidst all of these beliefs there are persons who are searching for the court of wisdom, the court of divine wisdom. As an act of mercy, always give them your hand. Now, you choose the path, to please the world or to please God. Death with man and Resurrection with the Father Master Garga Kuchin Summum Supremum Sanctuarium Gnosticum December 1964 6. Chapter 1 The Kundartigwador Organ Many millions of years have passed since the terrifying night of the past, in which we began slowly evolving and devolving. Yet, the human being still does not know who he is, where lie comes from, nor where is he going to. A lethargy of many centuries weighs over the ancient mysteries, yet, the verb still awaits at the bottom of the ark for the instant of its realization. Behind the Edenic tradition, there is a terrible cosmic desideratum and sacred errors which frighten and horrify. The gods also make mistakes. Thus, today, as all times, we are confronting our own destiny. We face the psychological dilemma of, to be, or not to be. Much has been said about the sacred serpent, yet, now we are going to clearly talk about the Kundartigwador organ. All of the efforts made by prophets, avatars, and gods in order to end the harmful consequences of the Kundartigwador organ have been in vain. It is necessary to know that the Kundartigwador organ is the negative development of the fire. This is the descending serpent, which precipitates itself from the coccyx downwards towards the atomic infernos of the human being. The Kundartigwador organ is the horrifying tale of Satan, which is shown in the body of desires of the intellectual animal, who in the present times is falsely called man. What is worst, which hurts the soul the most, is to know that the ones who gave the Kundartigwador organ to this humanity were some sacred individuals. Ancient traditions state that during the Lemurian epoch, certain sacred individuals came to the earth in a cosmic astroship. These individuals were forming a very high sacred commission, which was entrusted with studying the evolving and devolving problems of the earth and its humanity. The Archangel Sakaki and the principal archphysicist and universal common chemist Angel Loizos were the two main individuals from this holy divine commission. This sacred commission of ineffable beings is behind the whole drama of Eden. They came with bodies of flesh and bones, their ship landed on Lemuria. During that ancient age, the human instinct was starting to develop itself into objective reasoning. 7. This very high commission could verify to satiety that the Edenic human being already started to suspect the motive of his creation. The Lemurian root race had started to guess the true motives of its own existence, a miserable existence, with just mechanical motives. Each human being is a little machine who captures and transforms cosmic energies. Then he unconsciously adapts these energies into the interior layers of the earth. Thus, we are human machines, nothing else. What would this world be without the human machines? Without this seal, without this physiognomy which is supplied by this humanity, they planet would be without a purpose. Thus, everything which is without purpose ceases to exist. Humanity as a whole is an organ from nature. This organ collects and assimilates cosmic energies, which are necessary for the development of this planetary organism. Disgracefully, to be a machine is not very pleasant, yet, it is what the so-called human being is, he is a machine, that is what he is, yes, that, and nothing else. When a rebel rises with his weapons against nature, when he wants to stop being a machine, then, the tenebrous powers fight against him to death. The human beings who are capable of fighting the tenebrous forces, to fight against nature, against the cosmos, etc., are very rare. Commonly, these type of rebels capitulate. Many are called, yet few are chosen. Only a few individuals attain the victory against nature and achieve the right to sit on the throne of power in order to rule over it. The Lemurians already had suspected all of this. They understood with their instinct that human beings, 
after having offered their services as machines to this nature, were becoming perverse. Everywhere, within all of the corners of Lemuria, the Hueli of this tragedy was instinctively suspected. Yet, this tragedy wanted to appear into the Lemurians' objective reasoning. Therefore, this sacred commission, after having serenely inspected this problem, resolved to take drastic cosmic procedures in order to avoid the total dissolution of the human genre and even mass suicide. Great cosmic desiderata are behind Adam and Eve. This sacred commission is what is hidden behind that drama and Edenic scenario. Thus, everything was fulfilled and the human being received the damned stigma, the Kundartigwador organ. In the course of time, maybe many centuries after, dot the Holy Commission returned, this time commanded by the Arch Seraphim Sevatartra, due to the fact that the Archangel Sakaki had converted himself into one of the four Tetra Sustainers of the Universe. 8. Traditions state that they returned precisely three years later. Nonetheless, these three years are always symbolic. The fact then was that after a severe examination of the situation, the archphysician and chemist Angel Loizos destroyed the Kundartigwador organ from within the human race, since the human race did not need it anymore. The human being had abandoned all of his suspicions as he had become fascinated with the beauties of this world. The gods saved the human being from a great crisis. They achieved in making the human being fascinated with this world in order that he could live within it as any planetary citizen. Yet, the gods could not save him from the evil consequences of the Kundartigwador organ. Truly, the evil consequences of such an organ were converted into mistaken habits and customs, that entered the depths of our psyche and became converted into the subconsciousness. Thus, the subconsciousness is the same ego or the psychological I, that is rooted in the evil consequences of the Kundartigwador organ. The most saintly Ashiata Shemash fought very hard in order to take the evil consequences of the Kundartigwador organ out from humanity. The Holy Lama in Tibet also suffered very much in order to save humanity from the horrifying consequences of the mentioned fatal organ. Buddha, Jesus, Moses and other masters passed through much bitterness in order to liberate humanity from the disastrous consequences of the Kundartigwador organ. Therefore, the sacred commission of ineffable beings threw upon their shoulders a terrible cosmic karma. They will pay such karma in the future Manvantara. Listen to me, Gnostic brethren. You must comprehend that you can end the evil consequences of the Kundartigwador organ only with the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness. These three factors are a. Death of the psychological I b. Birth of the being within us c. Sacrifice for Humanity 9. The I dies based on rigorous creative comprehension. The being is born within us with the mate Huna, sexual magic. Sacrifice for Humanity is charity and very well understood. Love The schools which teach the ejaculation of semen, even when they do this in a very mystical way, are really black schools, because the Kundartigwador organ is developed with such a practice. The schools which teach the connection of the linga emyoni without the ejaculation of semen are white schools, because this is how the kundalini rises through the medullar canal. The schools which teach how to strengthen the psychological eye are black schools, because the evil consequences of the kundartigwador organ are strengthened with that procedure. The schools which teach the dissolution of the eye, mystical death, are white schools, because they destroy the evil consequences of the Kundartigwador organ. The Kundartigwador organ is the tail of Satan. It is the sexual fire descending from the coccyx downwards towards the atomic infernos of the human being. 10. Chapter 2 The End Seminus Beloved Gnostic Brethren This Christmas, it is necessary for you to deeply comprehend the evolutionary and devolutionary processes that the End Seminus undergoes because with infinite patience, you can find the whole ends virtutus of the fire element within it. Esoteric traditions state that after the disappearance of the Atlantean continent, certain knowledge related to the origin and significance of the ends seminis survived. 
Ancient traditions also state that this knowledge related with the Enseminus could survive the submerging of Atlantis. Yet, after 35 centuries of incessant wars, all of that knowledge was lost. Ancient priests state that from all of the primeval wisdom related with the Enseminus, there only remained the tradition which explicitly affirms that the possibility of the intimate self-realization exists with the exoary, semen, or sperm. Certain fragments of information which are dispersed everywhere in distinct places, indicate to us the methods in order to work with the Enseminus. The primeval Aryans. Descendants from the Atlanteans, tired with so many wars, started to acquire, to quest for. The esotericism of the Enseminus. The searchers yearning for the light knew very well through tradition that individual self-perfection is achieved with the Enseminus. Yet, they ignored the tantric clue of the Madhuna. Thus, they suffered while searching for it in vain. Truly, only the ancient Egyptian, Hindustani, etc. Hierophants who were descendants of the ancient Atlantean society called Akaldan, were in possession of the whole tantric science with the secret clue of the Madhuna. Admission into the ancient schools of the mysteries was something very difficult. Because the ordeals were terrible. Thus, there were few who passed them with success. The great quantity of yearners for the light knew nothing about the Madhuna, yet, through traditions they comprehended that self-perfection was achieved when the ends. Seminus was wisely transmuted. The ignorant always proceed with ignorance. This is why many believed that only with mere sexual abstinence, the problem of their self-realization was taken care of. 11. This mistaken concept originated many communities of abstinent monks, who were organized into sects and religions which were ignoring the Madhuna. These ignorant people believed that the problem in order to attain their self-perfection was resolved for them only with sexual abstinence. Ignorance was, has been, and always will be in that way. What is most grievous in this matter is that still in this day and age, not only monks but also many pseudo-occultists and pseudo-esoterists exist, who are convinced that only with sexual abstinence the problem of their intimate self-realization is resolved. Formidable evolutions are within the sperm, yet there are also tremendous devolutions. For instance, the natural process of development of the sperm is evolution in itself, since the sperm is the final outcome of what we eat and drink. It is also necessary to know that the evolutions of the sperm are submitted to the fundamental sacred cosmic law of the Heptaparaparshanic, which is the law of the Holy Seven, the Septenary Law. When the Enseminus, the sperm, has completed its septenary evolutions, then it must receive an external impulse and proceed to be transmuted with the Madhuna. Otherwise, the Enseminus enters into a full process of devolution or degradation, thus converting the individual into a degenerated infrasexual. The involution of the sperm, Enseminus, produces, among many other pernicious substances, one that is specifically malignant. It has the property of originating two types of actions within the general functioning of the physical organism. The first type of action consists of triggering the deposit of superfluous fat within the organism. The second type of action consists of originating within the human being certain malignant vibrations, which are known in esotericism as poison Ineoscurian vibrations. The first type originates human pigs, that is to say, horrible, obese humans, who are filled with fat. The second type originates skinny emaciated humans, who are intensely charged with the perverse poison Ineoscurian vibrations. These type of poison Ineoscurian vibrations manifest themselves in a dualistic way. 1. A high degree of fanaticism, 2. Expert cynicism. These are in synthesis, the dualistic manifestations of these tenebrous vibrations. Fanaticism tends to be external, while cynicism becomes internal. 12. Behold here the two sides of the same coin, the obverse and the reverse. What is most grave in this matter of absurd sexual abstinence is that the tenebrous poison Ineoscurian vibrations not only reinforce the evil consequences of the Kundartigwador organ, but Emma Reover, these vibrations can truly develop such a malignant organ as well. 
If we take into account the fact that opposite things complement and contain each other, for instance, the darknesses within the light and vice versa, within virtualize sin, its latent opposite, etc., then, we must comprehend in depth the word Kundalini. The word Kunda reminds us of the Kundartiguador organ, and Lini signifies end in the ancient Atlantean language. Therefore, the meaning of the word Kundalini is, the end, elimination, of the Kundartiguador organ. By deeply analyzing this matter, we arrive at the logical conclusion that we need the Madhuna in order to transmute the end seminis and to eliminate not only the Kundartiguador organ, but moreover, to eliminate the remaining evil consequences of such an organ. The hindmost vestiges of the Kundartiguador organ are eliminated when the eye is dissolved and the serpent of fire ascends up through the medullar canal. This is why we can give the name of Kundalini to the sacred fire, since this name signifies, the end, elimination, of the Kundartiguador organ. 13. Chapter 3. The Seven Cosmos. Kabbalah states that two cosmos exist, the macrocosm and the microcosm. The first one represents the infinitely large. The second one represents the infinitely small. This Kabbalistic teaching about the two cosmos is incomplete, because it is only a fragmentary teaching. Seven cosmos exist, not two, as some mistaken Kabbalists assume. The Absolute in itself, as explained by the Kabbalah, has three aspects, which are 1 Ansof or 2 Ansof 3 An The Ansof or becomes the exterior circle. The Ansof becomes the middle circle. The An is in fact, Sat, the unmanifest Absolute. The first cosmos could not exist within the unmanifest Am, not even within the Msof. The first cosmos can only exist within the Ansof or. This first cosmos is made of an entirely spiritual nature. Its name is Proto-Cosmos. The second is the Iacosmos or Megalocosmos, that is to say, the vast cosmos, or all of the suns, all of the worlds of the infinite space. The third cosmos is the Macrocosmos, which the Kabbalists refer to in their writings. This is formed by the Milky Way, with its 18 millions of suns that gravitate around the central sun Sirius. The fourth cosmos is the Deuterocosmos, which is constituted by the sun of our solar system and all of its laws. The fifth is the Mesocosmos, our planet Earth. The sixth is the Microcosm, man. The seventh is the Tritocosmos, the infinitely small, such as atoms, molecules, insects, microbes, electrons, etc., and also the Avici, the Abyss. 14. The mesocosmos and the deuterocosmos exist between the microcosm, man, and the macrocosm. Therefore, the phrase which states, man, the human being, is the microcosm of the macrocosm becomes a little capricious. Each one of the seven cosmos has its own laws. The Gnostic Initiate has to study the laws which govern over all of these seven cosmos with the goal of knowing the place that he occupies in life and what he must do in order to achieve the final liberation. 15. Chapter 4. The Ray of Creation. The Master O states that the Ray of Creation begins its development from the Absolute and ends in the Moon. Master O's mistake consists in believing that the Moon is a split off fragment from the Earth. The Moon is much more ancient than the Earth. It is already a dead world a planet which belonged to another ray of creation. Truly, our own ray of creation began in the Absolute and ended in the Inferno, Infernus, Avici, Greek Tartarus, Roman Averno, or, Submerged Mineral Kingdom, which is the fatal abode of the sub-lunar tenebrous entities. The proper arrangement of the ray of creation is as follows. 1. Absolute, Proto-Cosmos to all the worlds from all of the clusters of galaxies, Iacosmos. 3. A galaxy or group of suns, Macrocosmos. 4. The sun, solar system, Deuterocosmos. 5. The earth, or any of the planets, Mesocosmos. 6. The philosophical earth, human being, Microcosmos. 7. The abyss, hell, Tritocosmos. 
The brethren of the Gnostic movement must deeply comprehend the esoteric knowledge which we give in this Christmas message, in order for them to exactly know the place that they occupy in the ray of creation. We need to know, lie path in depth, with the goal of achieving the nativity within our heart and the final liberation. The ray of creation begins in the absolute with the proto-cosmos. All of the worlds in the ray of creation correspond to the Aya cosmos. All of the suns of this Milky Way, galaxy, correspond to the macrocosm in the ray of creation. The deuterocosmos within the ray of creation is the sun, solar system. Each mesocosmos within the ray of creation is composed of a planet of any solar system. Our planet Earth represents one among them. The microcosm is the human being within the ray of creation. The tritocosmos is the atom and the abyss. 16. The unique law, the law of the absolute, exists within the first cosmos. The law of the first cosmos is converted into three laws within the second cosmos. Thus, three are the laws which govern the second cosmos. The three laws are converted into six laws within the third cosmos. The six laws are duplicated into twelve within the fourth cosmos. The twelve laws are duplicated in order to become twenty and four laws within the fifth cosmos. The twenty and four laws are duplicated within the sixth cosmos, thus converting into forty and eight laws. The forty and eight laws are converted into ninety-six laws, by means of duplication, within the seventh cosmos. Therefore, the will of the Absolute, the unique law, is fulfilled within the proto-cosmos. This great law is converted into three within the second cosmos, which is the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, or positive force, negative force and neutral force. Mechanism starts within the third cosmos, because these three primordial laws divide themselves in order to become six laws. Life turns much more mechanical within the fourth cosmos, since there are no longer six laws, but twelve laws which govern in this cosmos. Life becomes very much more mechanical within the fifth cosmos, and almost has nothing to do with the will of the Absolute, because the twelve laws has become twenty-four laws. Life turns tremendously materialistic and mechanical within the sixth cosmos, so that the existence of the will of the Absolute is not even remotely suspected. We live in a mechanical world of 48 laws, a world where the will of the Absolute is not fulfilled, a spot in a very remote corner of the universe, a terribly dark and painful place. The position which we occupy in the ray of creation is sorrowful because in our world the will of the Absolute is not fulfilled, not even the will of three divine persons, called Father, Son and Holy Spirit is fulfilled. Forty-eight frightful mechanical laws govern and direct us. We are certainly wretched, exiled ones, who live in this valley of bitterness. Underneath us, in accordance with the 17. Ray of creation, only the disgraceful souls of the abyss exist, who are governed by the horrifying mechanism of 96 laws. We need to liberate ourselves from the 48 laws, in order to pass into the fifth cosmos, the one of 24 laws. Then we need to liberate ourselves from the fifth cosmos, in order to pass into the fourth cosmos, the one of 12 laws. Afterwards, our work of final liberation continues passing from the fourth cosmos into the third, and then into the second cosmos in order to finally reach the Absolute. All of the substances from all of the seven cosmos are within ourselves. We have the substance of the proto-cosmos within our thinking brain, head. We have the substance of the Aya cosmos within the thinking system or motor brain, distributed throughout the spinal cord. We have the substance of the macrocosm within the conscious brain, which is made up of all of the specific nervous centers of the human organism, and likewise so on. Therefore, the necessary materials for the great work are found within the human organism. If we achieve the creation of the superior existential bodies of the being, then, as a fact, we attain the liberation from all of the cosmos, including the seventh, in order to finally enter into the unmanifest absolute, sat, and the seed germs for the creation of all the existential superior bodies of the being are found deposited within the semen. The development of these seed germs is necessary and is only possible with the maithuna, sexual magic. 
We have already spoken about the existential superior bodies of the being in our former publications and messages. Therefore, our Gnostic students are already informed about the subject. We know that the astral body, do not confuse it with the lunar body, is governed by 24 laws and that the physical body is governed by 48 laws. If we create the astral body, then it is clear that we liberate ourselves from the fatal world of 48 laws. Thus, we convert ourselves into inhabitants of the world of 24 laws. 18. If we create the mental body, then we liberate ourselves from the world of the 24 laws. Thus, we enter into the world of 12 laws. Let us remember that the mental world is governed by 12 laws. If we create the causal body or the body of the conscious will, then we enter into the world of six laws. Thus, we convert ourselves into inhabitants of that world, because the body of the conscious will, the causal body, is governed by six laws. The work with the Madhuna and the dissolution of the I, plus the sacrifice for humanity, allows us to make new creations within ourselves in order to be liberated from the world of six laws, thus, passing beyond the Aya Cosmos and the ineffable Proto-Cosmos. It is necessary for all of our Gnostic students to comprehend this Christmas that they can only achieve the final liberation by creating the superior existential bodies of the being, by celebrating the death of their I, and by celebrating the nativity in their hearts. The being can only enter within the one who has created the superior existential bodies. The nativity of the heart can only be truly celebrated by the one who has created the superior existential bodies of the being. The constitution of the intellectual animal mistakenly called man, is the following. One physical body. Two vital body. Three lunar body of desires. Four lunar mental body. Five pluralized eye. Six the Buddhata. The three aspects of Atman Buddhaimanas, divine spirit, spirit of life, or human spirit, have not incarnated within the human being because he still does not possess the solar bodies, that is to say, the superior existential bodies of the being. The whole of our efforts are aimed towards the liberation of ourselves from the moon, which disgracefully we carry within our lunar bodies. We liberate ourselves from the lunar influence when we create the solar bodies. The luxury of creating our solar bodies can only be achieved with the Madhuna, sexual magic, because the seed germs of such bodies are found within the semen. The lunar bodies keep us living in the world of 48 laws, in this valley of bitterness. 19. The lunar bodies are feminine. This is why the men from this world are within the internal worlds, after death, as subconscious, cold, phantasmagoric women. It is very pitiable that the Theosophist and the Pseudo-Rosicrucian writers, etc., have not been capable of comprehending that the present internal vehicles of the human being are the lunar bodies which we must disintegrate, after we have created the solar bodies. To liberate ourselves from the world of the 48 laws, without having created the superior existential bodies of the being, is impossible. 20. Chapter 4. The Psychological I. The pseudo-occultists and pseudo-esoterists, divide the ego into two eyes, the superior eye and the inferior eye. Superior and inferior are a division of one organism itself. The superior eye and the inferior eye are both the eye, they are the whole ego. The intimate, the real being, is not the eye. The intimate transcends any type of eye. He is beyond any type of I. The intimate is the being. The being is the reality, he is what is not temporal, he is the divine. The I had a beginning and inevitably will have an end, since everything that has a beginning, will have an end. The being, the intimate, did not have a beginning, and so, he will not have an end. He is what he is. He is what has always been and what always will be. The I continues after death. The I returns to this valley of tears in order to repeat events, to satisfy its passions and to pay karma. The being does not continue, because he did not have a beginning. Only that which belongs to time is what continues, that which had a beginning. The being does not belong to time. 
that which continues is submitted to decrepitude, degeneration, pain, and passion. Our present life is the effect of our past life, it is a continuation of our past life, it is the effect of a former cause. Every cause has its effect, every effect has its cause. Every cause transforms itself into an effect, every effect converts itself into a cause. Our present life is the cause of our future life. The cause of our future life will be this present life with all of its errors and miseries. To continue means to postpone our errors and pain. Therefore, what we must do is to die from instant to instant in order for us not to continue. It is better to be than to continue. The eye is the origin of the error and of its consequence, which is pain. Thus, as long as the eye exists, pain and error will continue to exist. 21. To be born is painful, to die is painful, to live is painful. Pain exists in childhood, adolescence, youth, maturity, elderliness, because everything in this world has pain. Pain disappears when we cease to exist in all of the levels of the mind. Only by dissolving the psychological eye is how we radically cease to exist. The Kundartigwador organ is the origin of the eye. The eye is constituted by all of the evil consequences of the Kundartigwador organ. The eye is a bunch of passions, desires, fears, hatred, selfishness, envy, pride, gluttony, laziness, anger, attachments, appetites, morbid sentimentalism, heritage, family, race, nation, etc. The eye is multiple, the eye is not individual. The eye exists in a pluralized state, and continues in a pluralized state, thus it returns in its pluralized state. Therefore, as the water is compounded by many drops, as the flame is compounded by many igneous particles, as well, the eye is compounded by many eye. The eye, the ego, is constituted by thousands of little eye which continue after death and return to this valley of tears in order to satisfy its desires and to pay karma. As a movie of successive events, the eyes pass in a successive order on the screen of life, in order to represent their own role within the painful drama of life. Each eye of this tragic movie of life has its own mind, its own ideas and criteria, since one thing which pleases one eye, displeases another eye. The eye that today swears loyalty before the Gnostic altar, is later on displaced by another eye which hates Gnosis. The eye of a person which today swears eternal love to a beloved one, is later on displaced by another eye which has nothing to do with that person or with that oath. The intellectual animal mistakenly called man, has no individuality, because he does not have a permanent center of gravity. He only has the pluralized eye. Therefore, it is not strange that many people become affiliated with the Gnostic institutions, and later on, they become enemies of them. Today with Gnosis, and tomorrow against Gnosis. Today in one school, tomorrow in another. Today with one woman, tomorrow with another. Today a friend, tomorrow an enemy, etc. 22. Chapter V. Return and Reincarnation. Return and Reincarnation are two different laws. Severe analysis brings us to the conclusion that a difference exists between returning and reincarnating. The eye is not an individual, since it is constituted by many eyes. Thus, every eye, even when having something from our own subconsciousness, enjoys a Certain self-independence. The eye is a legion o' devils, thus, to affirm that this legion reincarnates is an absurdity. To affirm that an individual reincarnates, is exact, yet, it is not exact to affirm that the legion of eyes reincarnate. Millions of people exist in this world, yet, it is very difficult to find an individual. We become individuals only by creating our superior existential bodies of the being by dissolving the one, and by incarnating the being. The sacred individuals reincarnate, yet, the eye only returns into a new womb in order to dress, or better if we say, redress himself with a new suit of flesh. The eye continues in our mediate or immediate descendants. The eye is the race, the error, and the pain which continues. Some pseudo-occultist ignoramuses, mistakenly suppose that the personality 
reincarnates, thus, they frequently confuse the personality with the I. The personality is not the I, the personality does not reincarnate. The personality is a daughter of its time, thus, it dies in its time. The personality is not the physical body. The personality is not the vital body. The personality is not the I. The personality is not the soul. The personality is not the spirit. The personality is energetic, subtle, atomic, and it is formed during the first seven years in our childhood, based on heritage, customs, examples, etc. It strengthens itself with time and experiences. Three things go into the tomb or cemetery. One the physical body. Two the vital body. Three the personality. Twenty-three. The physical and vital bodies disintegrate themselves little by little, in a simultaneous way. Yet, the personality wanders around the cemetery or pantheon, and only through various centuries does it become disintegrated. The pluralized I is that which continues, that which is not disintegrated in the cemetery. Thus, the legion of eyes continues with a common body. Such a body is not the astral body, as many people suppose. The body that the Legion of I utilizes is the lunar body or molecular body. It is necessary for the Gnostic students not to confuse this lunar body with the solar body. The solar body is the astral body. Really, only those who have worked with the Mate Huna for many years can possess the astral body. The little I which abide within the lunar body project themselves throughout all of the regions of the cosmic mind. Then, they return into their common body the lunar body. Thus, the I dressed with its lunar body returns into a new womb in order to redress itself with the suit of flesh, and to repeat the same tragedies and bitterness in this valley of tears. Therefore, only those who possess the being can reincarnate. Those who do not possess the being only return. To possess the being is necessary in order to reincarnate. Not to possess the being is what is necessary in order to return. To reincarnate is a sacrifice, to return is a failure. Thus, the sacred individuals reincarnate in order to save the world. Yet, the imbeciles return in order to torment the world. Sacred reincarnations were always celebrated with great religious festivities in Tibet. Jesus of Nazareth was a reincarnation. The birth of Jesus was the greatest event of this world. 24. Chapter 6 Dissolution of the I. Brethren of mine. This Christmas, it is necessary for you to deeply comprehend the necessity of dissolving the I. The greatest danger that exists in life, is the danger of converting ourselves into Hanasmusians. Whosoever does not work in the dissolution of the I gradually degenerates himself more and more in each existence. Finally, he does not receive any more physical bodies. Because he has converted himself into a dangerous Hannes Mussian. Four types of Hannes Mussians exist. 1, 2, 3, 4. Hannes Mussians of a Cretinous type, very decrepit, stupid, and degenerate. Hannes Mussians who are strong, astute, and perverse. Hannes Mussians with a double center of gravity, but without an astral body, they only have a lunar body. Hannes Mussians with a double center of gravity and with an astral body. The Hannes Mussians of the first type are true Cretans, idiots, and degenerated people. They are extremely perverse, yet, they do not even have the strength in order to be perverse. This type is rapidly disintegrated after the death of their physical bodies. The Hannes Mussians of the second type keep returning to this world in organisms of the animal kingdom. The Hannes Mussians of the third type were initiates of white magic who acquired many psychic powers. Yet, they went astray from their path and fell into black magic, because they did not dissolve the eye. This type of Hannes Mussian is like two heads of a coin, the obverse and the reverse. They have two internal personalities, one is white and the other black. Each one of these personalities has its own self-independence and psychic powers. The Hannes Mussians of the fourth type are true fallen bodhisattvas, who committed the mistake of strengthening the eye. These Hannes Mussians have a double center of gravity. 
one is diabolical and the other divine. What is most awful in the fourth type is that they have an astral body. One example of this type is Andramlik. This Hanasmusian confuses the inexperienced evocator. Because there are two Andramleks, one white and the other black. Both are adepts, yet they are opposites. Despite this, they are one. Both are true masters, one is a master of the White Lodge, and the other of the Black Lodge. 25. Many initiates achieve the creation of their superior existential bodies of the being, yet, they fail because they do not dissolve the psychological I. These initiates cannot celebrate the nativity in their hearts, they cannot achieve the incarnation of their being in spite of possessing the superior existential bodies. Thus, they convert themselves into Hanasmusians with a double center of gravity. If deep self-realization is what we truly want, then it is necessary to comprehend the necessity of working with the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness. If any of the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness are excluded, then the outcome of this procedure is failure. Behold the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness. To be born, to die, and to sacrifice ourselves for humanity. Sexual magic, dissolution of the I, charity, this is the triple path of the righteous life. Some Gnostic students have written to us, asking for a didactic in order to dissolve the I. The best didactic for the dissolution of the I is found in practical life that is intensely lived. Conviviality is a marvelous full-length mirror, where the I can be contemplated in its entirety. The defects which are hidden in the bottom of our subconsciousness spontaneously emerge when we are in relationship with our fellow man. The defects burst out from us. Because our subconsciousness betrays us, and if we are in the state of alert perception, then we see them, just as they are in themselves. The greatest joy for the Gnostic is to celebrate the discovering of some of his defects. A discovered defect becomes a dead defect. When we discover any defect, then, we should see it in action, as when one is seeing a movie, yet, without judging or condemning it. To intellectually comprehend the discovered defect is not enough. It is necessary to submerge ourselves into profound interior meditation, in order to comprehend the defect in other levels of our mind. The mind has many levels and profundities. If we have not comprehended a defect in all the levels of the mind, then we have done nothing, because the defect continues existing. As a tempting demon in the bottom of our own subconsciousness. 26. When a defect is integrally comprehended in all the levels of the mind, then it is disintegrated along with the small I which characterizes it. Thus, the defect is reduced to cosmic dust in the supersensible worlds. This is how we die from moment to moment. This is how we establish a permanent center of consciousness, a permanent center of gravity within ourselves. The Buddhata, the interior Buddhist principle, the psychic material or the prime matter in order to build that which is called soul, exists within every human being who is not in an extreme state of degeneration. The pluralized I stupidly wastes such psychic material in absurd atomic explosions of envy, greed, hatred, fornication, attachment, vanity, etc. This psychic material is accumulated within ourselves in accordance with the death of the pluralized I, from moment to moment. Thus, we attain a permanent center of consciousness. This, is how we individualize ourselves little by little. When we rid ourselves of ego, then we become individualized. However, we clarify that individuality is not everything, because we have to pass into the supra-individuality when experiencing the event of Bethlehem. The work of the dissolution of the I is something very serious. We need to profoundly study ourselves in all of the levels of the mind, because the I is a book of many volumes. We need to study our thoughts, emotions, actions from moment to moment, without justifying them or condemning them. We need to integrally comprehend all and every one of our defects in all of the profundities of the mind. The pluralized I is the subconsciousness. When we dissolve the I, then, the subconsciousness is transformed into consciousness. We need to convert the subconsciousness into consciousness and this is only possible by achieving the annihilation of the I. 
Continuous awakened consciousness is acquired when our consciousness occupies the place of the subconsciousness. Whosoever enjoys continues conscience lives conscious each and every instant, not only in the physical world, but also in the superior worlds. 27. This present humanity is 97% in the subconscious. Therefore, this humanity profoundly sleeps, not only in this physical world, but also in the supersensible worlds during the sleep of the physical body, as well as after death. We need the death of our I. We need to die from moment to moment, here and now, not only in this physical world, but also in all of the planes of the cosmic mind. We need to be pitiless against ourselves in order to dissect the I with the tremendous scalpel of self-criticism. 28. Chapter 7. The Struggle of the Opposites. A great master said, Seek enlightenment for all else will be added onto you. Enlightenment's worst enemy is the I. It is necessary to know that the I is a knot in the flow of existence, a fatal obstruction in the flow of life free in its movement. A master was asked, What is the way? What a magnificent mountain, he said, referring to the mountain where he had his haven. I do not ask you about the mountain, instead I ask you about the path. As long as you cannot go beyond the mountain, you will not be able to find the way answered the master. Another monk asked the same question to that same master. There it is, right before your eyes the master ans word him. Why can I not see it? Because you have egotistical ideas. Will I ever be able to see it, sir? As long as you have a dualistic vision and you say I cannot, and so on, your eyes will. Be blinded by that relative vision. When there is no I nor you, can it be seen? When there is no I nor you, who wants to see? The foundation of the I is the dualism of the mind. The I is sustained by the battle of the opposites. All thinking is founded on the battle of the opposites. If we say that a person is tall, we want to say that he is not short. If we say that we are entering, we want to say that we are not exiting. If we say that we are happy, with that we affirm that we are not sad, etc. The problems of life are nothing but mental forms with two poles, one positive and the other negative. Problems are sustained by the mind and are created by the mind. A. Problem inevitably ends when we stop thinking upon it. Happiness and sadness, pleasure and pain, good and evil, victory and defeat constitute the battle of the opposites on which the I is founded. 29. The entire miserable life that we live goes from one opposite to another, victory, defeat, like, dislike, pleasure, pain, failure, success, this and that, etc. We need to free ourselves of the tyranny of the opposites. This is only possible by learning to live from instant to instant, without abstractions of any type, without dreams, without fantasies. Have you observed how the stones of the road are pale and pure after a torrential rain? One can only murmur an O, oh, of admiration. We should comprehend that O, oh, of things without deforming that divine exclamation with the battle of the opposites. Joshu asked the master Nansen, what is the Tao? Ordinary life replied Nansen. What does one do to live in accordance with it? If you try to live in accordance with it, it will flee away from you. Do not try to sing that song, let it sing itself. Does not the humble hiccup come by itself? Remember this phrase, Gnosis lives in deeds, withers away in abstractions, and is difficult to find even in the noblest of thoughts. Master Bokujo was asked, Do we have to dress and eat daily? How can we escape from this? The master replied, We eat, we get dressed. I do not comprehend, said the disciple. Then get dressed and eat, said the master. This is precisely action free of the opposites, do we eat, do we get dressed? Why make a problem of that? Why think of other things while we are eating and getting dressed? If you are eating, eat. If you are getting dressed, get dressed, and if you are walking on the street, walk, 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 but do not think of something else. 
do only what you are doing. Do not run away from facts, do not fill them with so many meanings, symbols, sermons, and warnings. Live them without allegories, live them with a receptive mind, from instant to instant. Comprehend that I am talking to you about the path of action, free of the painful battle of the opposites. This is action without distractions, without evasions, without fantasies, without abstractions of any kind. Change your character, beloved disciples. Change it through intelligent action, free of the battle of the opposites. 30. When the doors are closed to fantasy, the organ of intuition is awakened. Action, free of the battle of the opposites, is intuitive action, complete action. Where there is plenitude, the eye is absent. Intuitive action leads us by the hand to the awakening of the consciousness. Let us work and rest happily abandoning ourselves to the course of life. Let us exhaust the turbid and rotten water of habitual thinking. In that emptiness gnosis will flow and with it the happiness of living. This intelligent action, free of the battle of the opposites elevates us to a point in which something must break. When everything marches well, the rigid roof of thinking breaks and the light and the power of the inner self enters like a flood into the mind which has stopped dreaming. Then, in the physical world and outside of it, during the sleep of the material body, we live totally conscious and enlightened, enjoying the joy of life in the superior worlds. This continuous tension of the mind, this discipline, takes us to the awakening of the consciousness. If we are eating and thinking about business, it is clear that we are dreaming. If we are driving an automobile and we are thinking of our fiancé, it is logical that we are not awake, we are dreaming. If we are working and we are remembering our child's godfather or godmother, our friend, or brother, etc., it is clear that we are dreaming. People who live dreaming in the physical world, also live dreaming in the internal worlds, during those hours in which the physical body is sleeping. One needs to cease dreaming in the internal worlds. When we stop dreaming in the physical world, we awaken here and now, and that awakening appears in the internal worlds. First seek enlightenment and all else shall be added unto you. Whosoever is enlightened sees the way. Whosoever is not enlightened cannot see the way and can easily be led astray from the path and fall into the abyss. Terrible is the effort and the vigilance needed from second to second, from instant to instant, in order not to fall into illusions. 31. One minute of unawareness is enough and the mind is already dreaming, recalling something, thinking of something different from the job or deed that we are living at that moment. When we learn to be awake from instant to instant in the physical world, we shall live awake and conscious of the self from instant to instant in the internal worlds, during the hours the physical body sleeps and also after death. It is painful to know that the consciousness of all human beings sleeps and dreams profoundly, not only during those hours of rest of the physical body, but also during that state ironically called the vigil state. Action free of mental dualism produces the awakening of the consciousness. 32. Chapter 8. The Technique of Meditation. The technique of meditation permits us to arrive at the heights of illumination. We should distinguish between a mind that is still and a mind that is stilled by force. We should distinguish between a mind that is in silence and a mind that is violently silenced. When the mind is stilled by force, it is really not still. It is gagged by violence and in the deeper levels of understanding there exists an entire tempest. When the mind is violently silenced, it is really not in silence. Deep within, it clamors, shouts, and despairs. It is necessary to put an end to modifications of the thinking system during meditation. When the thinking system remains under our control, illumination comes to us spontaneously. Mental control permits us to destroy the shackles created by the mind. To achieve the stillness and silence of the mind, it is necessary to know how to live from instant to instant, to know how to take advantage of each moment, to not live the moment in doses. Take everything from each moment, because each moment is a child of gnosis, each moment is absolute, alive, and significant. Momentariness is a special characteristic of the Gnostics. We love the philosophy of momentariness. 
Master Amum said to his disciples, If you walk, walk, if you sit, sit, but do not vacillate. To commence with the study of the technique of meditation is to enter into the antechamber of the divine peace that surpasses all knowledge. The most elevated form of thinking is non-thinking. When one achieves the stillness and silence of the mind, the eye with all its passions, dens, appetites, fears, affections, etc. becomes absent. It is only in the absence of the eye, in the absence of the mind, that the Buddha can awaken to unite with the inner self and take us to ecstasy. 33. The school of black magic of the Subab states that the monad or the great reality will penetrate in him who does not possess the existential bodies of the being. This is a false statement. What enters into those tenebrous fanatics of Subab are evil entities that express themselves through these people with gestures, actions, bestial and absurd words. Such people are possessed by the tenebrous ones. The stillness and silence of the mind has a single objective, to liberate the essence from the mind, so that when fused with the monad or inner self, it, the essence, can experience that which we call the truth. During ecstasy and in the absence of the I, the essence can live freely in the world of the mist of fire, experiencing the truth. When the mind is in a passive and receptive state, Absolutely still and in silence, the essence or buddhata is liberated from the mind, and ecstasy arrives. The essence is always bottled up in the battle of the opposites, but when the battling ends and the silence is absolute, then the essence remains free and the bottle is broken into pieces. When we practice meditation, our mind is assaulted by many memories, desires, passions, preoccupations, etc. We should avoid the conflict between attention and distraction. A conflict exists between attention and distraction when we combat those assailants of the mind. The eye is the projector of such mental assailants. Where there is conflict, stillness and silence cannot exist. We should nullify the projector through self-observation and comprehension. Examine each image, each memory, each thought that comes to the mind. Remember that every thought has two poles, positive and negative. Entering and leaving are two aspects of a same thing. The dining room and the washroom, tall and short, pleasant and unpleasant, etc. are always two poles of the same thing. Examine the two poles of each mental form that comes to the mind. Remember that only through the study of these polarities can one arrive at a synthesis. Every mental form can be eliminated through its synthesis. Example, the memory of a fiancé assaults us. Is she beautiful? Let us think that beauty is the opposite of ugliness. And that if, in her youth she is beautiful, in her old age, she will be ugly. The synthesis, it, is not worthy to think about her, she is an illusion, a flower that inevitably withers. 34. In India, this self-observation and study of our psyche is properly called Pratyahara. Bird-like thoughts should pass through the space of our own mind in a successive parade, but without leaving any trace. The infinite procession of thoughts projected by the eye are exhausted in the end, and then the mind remains still and in silence. A great self-realized master said, only when the projector, in other words, the eye is completely absent, then befalls the silence which is not a product of the mind. This silence is inexhaustible, it is not of time, it is immeasurable. Only then arrives that which is. This whole technique is summarized in two principles. One profound reflection. Two tremendous serenity. This technique of meditation with its non-thinking, puts to work the most central part of the mind, the one that produces the ecstasy. Remember that the central part of the mind is that which is called buddhata, the essence, the consciousness. When the buddhata awakens, we remain illuminated. We need to awaken the buddhata, the consciousness. The Gnostic student can practice meditation seated in the Western or Oriental style. It is advisable to practice with eyes closed to avoid the distractions of the exterior world. It is also convenient to relax the body carefully avoiding any muscle remaining in tension. The buddhata, the essence, is the psychic material, 
the inner Buddhist principle, the spiritual material or prime matter with which we will give shape to the soul. The Buddhata is the best that we have within and awakens with profound inner meditation. The Buddhata is really the only element that the poor intellectual animal possesses to arrive at the experience of that which we call the truth. The only thing that the intellectual animal can do, being unable to incarnate the being, due to the fact that he still does not possess the superior existential bodies, is to practice meditation, to auto-awaken the Buddhata and to know the truth. 35. Jesus, the Divine Master whose nativity we celebrate this year, in 1964, said, Know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John, 8, 32. 36. Chapter 9. The Ecstasy. Isen sent a mirror to Master Khoisan, who showed it to his monks and said, Is this Isen's mirror, or my mirror? If you say that it belongs to Isen, how is it that it is in my hands? If you say that it is mine, have I not received it from Isen's hands? Speak, speak, or else I will break it to pieces. The monks were unable to pass between those two opposites and the master broke the mirror into pieces. Ecstasy is impossible as long as the essence is bottled up in the opposites. In the times of Babylon, the Bodhisattva of the most saintly Ashiata Shimash, a great Avatar, came to the world. The Bodhisattva was not fallen and like every Bodhisattva, he had his superior existential bodies of the being normally developed. When he reached a responsible age he arrived at the Vezinian mountain and entered a cavern. The tradition narrates that Lai carried out three tremendous fasts of forty days, each accompanied by intentional and voluntary suffering. He dedicated the first fast to prayer and meditation. The second fast was dedicated to reviewing his entire life and his past lives. The third fast was definitive. It was dedicated to putting an end to the mechanical association of the mind. Lai did not eat, he only drank water, and every half hour he pulled out two hairs from his chest. There are two types of mechanical association which are the foundation of the opposites. A. Mechanical association by means of ideas, words, phrases, etc., b. Mechanical association by images forms, things, persons, etc. An idea associates with another, a word with another, a phrase with another, and the battle of the opposites follows. 37. One person associates with another, the memory of someone comes to his mind. An image associates with another, a form with another, and the battle of the opposites continues. The Bodhisattva of the Avatar Ashiata Shimash suffered the unutterable. Fasting for forty days, mortifying himself horribly, sunk in profound inner meditation, he achieved the disassociation from the mental mechanism, and his mind remained solemnly still and in imposing silence. The result was ecstasy with the incarnation of his real being. Ashiata Shimash carried out a great work in Asia, founding monasteries and establishing rulers with awakened consciousness everywhere. This Bodhisattva was able to incarnate his real being during meditation because he already possessed the superior existential bodies of the being. Those who do not have the superior existential bodies of the being cannot succeed in getting the divinity or the being to operate or incarnate in them. However, they are able to liberate their essence so that it will fuse with their being and participate in his ecstasy. In the state of ecstasy, we can study the great mysteries of life and death. We have to study the ritual of life and death until the celebrant, the inner self, the being, arrives. It is only in the absence of the I that one can experience the bliss of the being. Only in the absence of the I can ecstasy be attained. When one achieves the dissolution of the mental mechanism, then comes that which the Oriental race calls, the breaking of the bag, eruption of the void. Then there is a shout of joy because the essence, the Buddhata, has escaped from within the battle of the opposites, and it now participates in the communion of the saints. Only through the experience of the ecstasy can we know what the truth and life is. Only in the absence of the I can we enjoy the joy of life and its movement. Only in the state of ecstasy can we discover the deep significance of the nativity, 
which every year we always celebrate with jubilation in our hearts. When in the state of ecstasy we study the life of Christ. Then we discover that a great fragment of this cosmic drama represented by the Lord remains unwritten. We must practice daily Gnostic meditation, it can be practiced alone or in a group. 38. This technique of meditation, taught in this book, must be established in all of the Gnostic Lumisials as an obligation, thus, converting those Lumisials into centers of meditation. All of the Gnostic brethren must gather, sit, and meditate as a group. Every Gnostic group must practice this technique of meditation before or after the meetings of second chamber. This technique of meditation also can and must be practiced daily in our homes. Those who can go out to the woods, to the country, must do so in order to meditate within the silence of the forest. It is necessary to include within the order of the Gnostic Lumisials the technique of meditation, based on the message and the teachings of this book. Thus, we deliver the unique technique of meditation that must be accepted in all of the Lumisials. It is false to asseverate that the great reality can operate inside of an individual who does not possess the existential bodies of the being. It is stupid to affirm that the great reality can penetrate inside of any body, as the tenebris from Subab assert, in order, they say, to cast out of ourselves the instinctive submerged animal entities which constitute the pluralized I. We repeat, the great reality cannot penetrate inside of those who do not possess the superior existential bodies of the being. We can create the superior existential bodies of the being only with the mate Huna, sexual magic. The great avatar Ashyata Shimash could incarnate within his Bodhisattva, when the mind of the latter was in absolute quietude and silence. This was due to the concrete fact that he already was in possession of his superior existential bodies of the being from ancient reincarnations. It is also necessary to clarify that after the ecstasy, and in spite of having received a tremendous amount of energy, the I is not dissolved, as many students of occultism mistakenly believe. The dissolution of the I is only possible through profound comprehension and through incessant daily work on ourselves, from instant to instant. We explain all of this in order not to confuse the Gnostic meditation with the tenebrous practices of Subab, and many other schools of black magic. When a mystic attains the ecstasy, and returns into his physical body, then he feels the urgent necessity of creating the superior existential bodies of the being and the indescribable longing of dissolving the I. 39. The ecstasy is not a nebulous state, but a transcendental state of wonderment, which is associated with perfect mental clarity. Brethren of mine, I wish for you a Merry Christmas and a prosperous New Year. May the Star of Bethlehem shine upon your path. Inverential Peace Samael Onweer 40. Does not know who he is, where Lai comes from, nor where is he going to. A lethargy of many centuries weighs over the ancient mysteries, yet, the verb still awaits at the bottom of the ark for the instant of its realization. Behind the Edenic tradition, there is a terrible cosmic desideratum and sacred errors which frighten and horrify. The gods also make mistakes. Thus, today, as all times, we are confronting our own destiny. We face the psychological dilemma of, to be, or not to be. Much has been said about the sacred serpent, yet, now we are going to clearly talk about the Kundartigwador organ. All of the efforts made by prophets, avatars, and gods in order to end the harmful consequences of the Kundartigwador organ have been in vain. It is necessary to know that the Kundartigwador organ is the negative development of the fire. This is the descending serpent, which precipitates itself from the coccyx downwards. Towards the atomic infernos of the human being. The Kundartigwador organ is the horrifying tale of Satan, which is shown in the body of desires of the intellectual animal, who in the present times is falsely called man. What is worst, which hurts the soul the most, is to know that the ones who gave the Kundartigwador organ to this humanity were some sacred individuals. Ancient traditions state that during the Lemurian epoch us to the awakening of the consciousness. If we are eating and thinking about business, it is clear that we are dreaming. If we are driving an automobile and we are thinking of our fiancé, 
it is logical that we are not. Awake, we are dreaming. If we are working and we are remembering our child's godfather or godmother, our friend, or brother, etc., it is clear that we are dreaming. People who live dreaming in the physical world, also live dreaming in the internal worlds, during those hours in which the physical body is sleeping. One needs to cease dreaming in the internal worlds. When we stop dreaming in the physical world, we awaken here and now, and that awakening appears in the internal worlds. First seek enlightenment and all else shall be added unto you. Whosoever is enlightened sees the way. Whosoever is not enlightened cannot see the way and can easily be led astray from the path and fall into the abyss. Terrible is the effort and the vigilance needed from second to second, from instant to instant, in order not to fall into illusions. 31. One minute of unawareness is enough and the mind is already dreaming, recalling something, thinking of something different from the job or deed that we are living at that moment. When we learn to be awake from instant to instant in the physical world, we shall live awake and conscious of the self from instant to instant in the internal worlds, during the hour's interior meditation, in order to comprehend the defect in other levels of our mind. The mind has many levels and profundities. If we have not comprehended a defect in all the levels of the mind, then we have done nothing, because the defect continues existing. As a tempting demon in the bottom of our own subconsciousness. 26. When a defect is integrally comprehended in all the levels of the mind, then it is disintegrated along with the small eye which characterizes it. Thus, the defect is reduced to cosmic dust in the supersensible worlds. This is how we die from moment to moment. This is how we establish a permanent center of consciousness, a permanent center of gravity within ourselves. The Buddhata, the interior Buddhist principle, the psychic material or the prime matter in order to build that which is called soul, exists within every human being who is not in an extreme state of degeneration. The pluralized eye stupidly wastes such psychic material in absurd atomic explosions of envy, greed, hatred, fornication, attachment, vanity, etc. This psychic material is accumulated within ourselves in accordance with the death of the pluralized eye, from moment to moment. Thus, we attain a permanent center of consciousness. This, is how we individualize ourselves little by little. When we rid ourselves of ego almost has nothing to do with the will of the Absolute, because the twelve laws has become twenty-four laws. Life turns tremendously materialistic and mechanical within the sixth cosmos, so that the existence of the will of the Absolute is not even remotely suspected. We live in a mechanical world of forty-eight laws, a world where the will of the Absolute is not fulfilled, a spot in a very remote corner of the universe, a terribly dark and painful place. The position which we occupy in the ray of creation is sorrowful because in our world the will of the Absolute is not fulfilled, not even the will of three divine persons, called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is fulfilled. Forty-eight frightful mechanical laws govern and direct us. We are certainly wretched, exiled ones, who live in this valley of bitterness. Underneath us, in accordance with the 17. Ray of creation, only the disgraceful souls of the abyss exist, who are governed by the horrifying mechanism of 96 laws. We need to liberate ourselves from the 48 laws, in order to pass into the fifth cosmos, the one of 24 laws. Then we need to liberate ourselves from the fifth cosmos, in order to pass into the fourth cosmos, the one of twelve laws. Afterwards, our work of final liberation continues passing from the fourth cosmos into the third, and then into the second cosmos in order to when one achieves the dissolution of the mental mechanism, then comes that which the oriental race calls, the breaking of the bag, eruption of the void. Then there is a shout of joy because the essence, the Buddhata, has escaped from within the battle of the opposites, and it now participates in the communion of the saints. Only through the experience of the ecstasy can we know what the truth in life is. Only in the absence of the I can we enjoy the joy of life and its movement. Only in the state of ecstasy can we discover the deep significance of the nativity, which every year we always celebrate with jubilation in our hearts. 
when in the state of ecstasy we study the life of Christ. Then we discover that a great fragment of this cosmic drama represented by the Lord remains unwritten. We must practice daily Gnostic meditation, it can be practiced alone or in a group. 38. This technique of meditation, taught in this book, must be established in all of the Gnostic Lumisials as an obligation, thus, converting those Lumisials into centers of meditation. All of the Gnostic brethren must gather, sit, and meditate as a group. Every Gnostic group must practice this technique of meditation before or after the meetings of second chamber. This technique of meditation also can and must be practiced daily in our homes. Those who can go out to the woods, to the country, must do so in order to meditate arrives. The essence is always bottled up in the battle of the opposites, but when the battling ends and the silence is absolute, then the essence remains free and the bottle is broken into pieces. When we practice meditation, our mind is assaulted by many memories, desires, passions, preoccupations, etc. We should avoid the conflict between attention and distraction. A conflict exists between attention and distraction when we combat those assailants of the mind. The eye is the projector of such mental assailants. Where there is conflict, stillness and silence cannot exist. We should nullify the projector through self-observation and comprehension. Examine each image, each memory, each thought that comes to the mind. Remember that every thought has two poles, positive and negative. Entering and leaving are two aspects of a same thing. The dining room and the washroom, tall and short, pleasant and unpleasant, etc. are always two poles of the same thing. Examine the two poles of each mental form that comes to the mind. Remember that only through the study of these polarities can one arrive at a synthesis. Every mental form can be eliminated through its synthesis. Example, the memory of a fiancé assaults us. Is she beautiful? Let us think that beauty is the opposite of ugliness violence and in the deeper levels of understanding there exists an entire tempest. When the mind is violently silenced, it is really not in silence. Deep within, it clamors, shouts, and despairs. It is necessary to put an end to modifications of the thinking system during meditation. When the thinking system remains under our control, illumination comes to us spontaneously. Mental control permits us to destroy the shackles created by the mind. To achieve the stillness and silence of the mind, it is necessary to know how to live from instant to instant, to know how to take advantage of each moment, to not live the moment in doses. Take everything from each moment, because each moment is a child of gnosis, each moment is absolute, alive, and significant. Momentariness is a special characteristic of the Gnostics. We love the philosophy of momentariness. Master Umum said to his disciples, If you walk, walk, if you sit, sit, but do not vacillate. To commence with the study of the technique of meditation is to enter into the antechamber of the divine peace that surpasses all knowledge. The most elevated form of thinking is non-thinking. When one achieves the stillness and silence of the mind, the eye with all its passions, dens, appetites, fears, affections, etc. becomes absent. It is ease that it holds. It so happens that those who have never read it are the ones that come to refute what the Sixth Commandment has to say. They usually state, well, does not the Bible tell us to be fruitful and multiply, Genesis 1, 28. This quoted order was only given to Adam, and only according to the wisdom of Genesis. This event occurred when he had not yet been given a wife, a woman, and at an evolutionary stage when he was still an androgynous creature. The people who oppose the Sixth Commandment, you shall not fornicate, also do so because they are horrified with the idea that the whole world will become desolate, that life will come to an end. They repeat this argument to every Gnostic who is out, explaining to them the real meaning of the Sixth Commandment. Well, we only need to reply. These teachings are being given only to Gnostic people. Humanity is not going to come to an end because that is the reason why you are here, to reproduce yourselves like the 
rest of the creatures of the earth. Your women will have children with great pain, and at a great cost. However, we will choose from these children those who will be best for the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. People have cleverly disguised what the Sixth Commandment implies, and they even mistake this a child of Gnosis, each moment is absolute, alive, and significant. Momentariness is a special characteristic of the Gnostics. We love the philosophy of momentariness. Master Umum said to his disciples, If you walk, walk, if you sit, sit, but do not vacillate. To commence with the study of the technique of meditation is to enter into the antechamber of the divine peace that surpasses all knowledge. The most elevated form of thinking is non-thinking. When one achieves the stillness and silence of the mind, the I with all its passions, dens, appetites, fears, affections, etc. becomes absent. It is only in the absence of the I, in the absence of the mind, that the Buddha can awaken to unite with the inner self and take us to ecstasy. 33. The school of black magic of the Subab states that the monad or the great reality will penetrate in him who does not possess the existential bodies of the being. This is a false statement. What enters into those tenebrous fanatics of subab are evil entities that express themselves through these people with gestures, actions, bestial and absurd words. Such people are possessed by the tenebrous ones. The stillness and silence of the mind has a single objective, to liberate the essence from the mind, so that when fused with the monad or inner self, it, from the lunar influence when we create the solar bodies. The luxury of creating our solar bodies can only be achieved with the Maithuna, sexual magic, because the seed germs of such bodies are found within the semen. The lunar bodies keep us living in the world of 48 laws, in this valley of bitterness. 19. The lunar bodies are feminine. This is why the men from this world are within the internal worlds, after death, as subconscious, cold, phantasmagoric women. It is very pitiable that the Theosophist and the Pseudo-Rosicrucian writers, etc., have not been capable of comprehending that the present internal vehicles of the human being are the lunar bodies which we must disintegrate, after we have created the solar bodies. To liberate ourselves from the world of the 48 laws, without having created the superior existential bodies of the being, is impossible. 20. Chapter 4. The Psychological Eye. The pseudo-occultists and pseudo-esoterists, divide the ego into two eyes, the superior eye and the inferior eye. Superior and inferior are a division of one organism itself. The superior eye and the inferior eye are both the eye, they are the whole ego. The intimate, the real being, is not the eye. The intimate transcends any type of eye. He is beyond any type of eye. The intimate is the, and so on, your eyes will. Be blinded by that relative vision. When there is no I nor you, can it be seen? When there is no I nor you, who wants to see? The foundation of the I is the dualism of the mind. The I is sustained by the battle of the opposites. All thinking is founded on the battle of the opposites. If we say that a person is tall, we want to say that he is not short. If we say that we are entering, we want to say that we are not exiting. If we say that we are happy, with that we affirm that we are not sad, etc. The problems of life are nothing but mental forms with two poles, one positive and the other negative. Problems are sustained by the mind and are created by the mind. A problem inevitably ends when we stop thinking upon it. Happiness and sadness, pleasure and pain, good and evil, victory and defeat constitute the battle of the opposites on which the I is founded. 29. The entire miserable life that we live goes from one opposite to another, victory, defeat, like, dislike, pleasure, pain, failure, success, this and that, etc. We need to free ourselves of the tyranny of the opposites. This is only possible by learning to live from instant to instant, without abstractions of if creation. The Master O states that the ray of creation begins its development from the Absolute and ends in the Moon. 
Master O's mistake consists in believing that the moon is a split. Off fragment from the earth. The moon is much more ancient than the earth. It is already a dead world, a planet which belonged to another ray of creation. Truly, our own ray of creation began in the absolute and ended in the inferno, infernus, avici, Greek Tartarus, Roman Averno, or, submerged mineral kingdom, which is the fatal abode of the sub-lunar tenebrous entities. The proper arrangement of the ray of creation is as follows. One absolute, protocosmos. To all the worlds from all of the clusters of galaxies, Iacosmos. Three A galaxy or group of suns, Macrocosmos. Four the sun, solar system, Deuterocosmos. Five the earth, or any of the planets, Mesocosmos. Six the philosophical earth, human being, Microcosmos. Seven the abyss, hell, Tritocosmos. The brethren of the Gnostic movement must deeply comprehend the esoteric knowledge which we give in this Christmas message, in order for them to exactly know the place that they occupy in the ray of creation. We need to know, lie path in depth, with the goal of a cheap that leads us to our own Christification. The door which we must enter is sex. Remember that the Christ said to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life no man cometh unto thee. Father, but by me. St. John 14, 6. That is also why the ascent, or the rising of the sacred fire or the Holy Spirit is reigned or determined by the merits of the heart. The dwelling of the Father is in the head, in the highest place. The house of the Son is in the middle, in the heart. The house or dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, which is the sexual fire is in the coccygeal bones, the sacral bones, and right in front of the guarded entrance. 2. Where Jehovah placed the angel with the sword of Lyrae, after throwing man out of paradise. Only the pure and chaste can really understand the Holy Bible and figure out the deep mysteries that it holds. It so happens that those who have never read it are the ones that come to refute what the Sixth Commandment has to say. They usually state, well, does not the Bible tell us to be fruitful and multiply? Genesis 1, 28. This quoted order was only given to Adam, and only according to the wisdom of Genesis. This event occurred when he had not yet been given a wife, a woman, and at an evolutionary stable as long as the essence is bottled up in the opposites. In the times of Babylon, the Bodhisattva of the most saintly Ashiata Shemash, a great avatar, came to the world. The Bodhisattva was not fallen and like every Bodhisattva, he had his superior existential bodies of the being normally developed. When he reached a responsible age he arrived at the Vezinian mountain and entered a cavern. The tradition narrates that Lai carried out three tremendous fasts of forty days, each accompanied by intentional and voluntary suffering. He dedicated the first fast to prayer and meditation. The second fast was dedicated to reviewing his entire life and his past lives. The third fast was definitive. It was dedicated to putting an end to the mechanical association of the mind. Lai did not eat, he only drank water, and every half hour he pulled out two hairs from his chest. There are two types of mechanical association which are the foundation of the opposites. A. Mechanical association by means of ideas, words, phrases, etc., b, mechanical association by images forms, things, persons, etc. An idea associates with another, a word with another, a phrase with another, and the battle of the opposites follows. 37. One person associates with another, death with man and resurrection with the Father. Master Garga Kuchin. Summum Supremum Sanctuarium Gnosticum. December 1964 6. Chapter 1 The Kundartigwador Organ Many millions of years have passed since the terrifying night of the past, in which we began slowly evolving and devolving. Yet, the human being still does not know who he is, where lie comes from, nor where is he going to. A lethargy of many centuries weighs over the ancient mysteries, yet, 
the verb still awaits at the bottom of the ark for the instant of its realization. Behind the Edenic tradition, there is a terrible cosmic desideratum and sacred errors which frighten and horrify. The gods also make mistakes. Thus, today, as all times, we are confronting our own destiny. We face the psychological dilemma of, to be, or not to be. Much has been said about the sacred serpent, yet, now we are going to clearly talk about the Kundar Tigwador organ. All of the efforts made by prophets, avatars, and gods in order to end the harmful consequences of the Kundar Tigwador organ have been in vain. It is necessary to know that the Kundar Tigwador organ is the negative development of the fire. This is the descending serpent, which precipitates itself from the coccyx downward and confuses the inexperienced evocator. Because there are two andrame legs, one white and the other black. Both are adepts, yet they are opposites. Despite this, they are one. Both are true masters, one is a master of the White Lodge, and the other of the Black Lodge. 25. Many initiates achieve the creation of their superior existential bodies of the being, yet, they fail because they do not dissolve the psychological eye. These initiates cannot celebrate the nativity in their hearts, they cannot achieve the incarnation of their being in spite of possessing the superior existential bodies. Thus, they convert themselves into Hannah's Musians with a double center of gravity. If deep self-realization is what we truly want, then it is necessary to comprehend the necessity of working with the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness. If any of the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness are excluded, then the outcome of this procedure is failure. Behold the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness. To be born, to die and to sacrifice ourselves for humanity. Sexual magic, dissolution of the I, charity, this is the triple path of the righteous life. Some Gnostic students have written to us, asking for a didactic in order to dissolve the I. The best didactic for the dissolution of the I is found in practice. The very religious people who study the Bible refute it and say that those statements are from the Old Testament and that they are out of use. Yet, Christ said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one title, shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled, Matthew 5, 17, 18. We should ask these religious people, why do you then accept the Ten Commandments and why do you accept the tithes from your congregation? Are these two not part of the Old Testament as well? Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 19 The dictionary defines the word kiss as follows, touching a person or a thing with the lips, contracting or dilating them softly, to manifest love, friendship, or reverence. Now we really wonder how would an intellectual man interpret the meaning of kiss if he was strolling with his lady friend and all of a sudden a complete stranger to both of them would come over and kiss her on the cheek. Would he interpret it merely by the definition of the dictionary or would he interpret it according to they become enemies of them today with gnosis, and tomorrow against gnosis. Today in one school, tomorrow in another. Today with one woman, tomorrow with another. Today a friend, tomorrow an enemy, etc. 22. Chapter V. Return and Reincarnation. Return and Reincarnation are two different laws. Severe analysis brings us to the conclusion that a difference exists between returning and reincarnating. The eye is not an individual since it is constituted by many eyes. Thus, every eye, even when having something from our own subconsciousness, enjoys a certain self-independence. The eye is a legion o' devils, thus, to affirm that this legion reincarnates is an absurdity. To affirm that an individual reincarnates, is exact, yet, it is not exact to affirm that the legion of eyes reincarnate. Millions of people exist in this world, Yet, 
it is very difficult to find an individual. We become individuals only by creating our superior existential bodies of the being, by dissolving the one, and by incarnating the being. The sacred individuals reincarnate, yet, the I only returns into a new womb in order to dress, or better if we say, redress himself with a new suit of flesh. The ends. Seminus was wisely transmuted. The ignorant always proceed with ignorance. This is why many believed that only with mere sexual abstinence, the problem of their self-realization was taken care of. 11. This mistaken concept originated many communities of abstinent monks, who were organized into sects and religions which were ignoring the Madhuna. These ignorant people believed that the problem in order to attain their self-perfection was resolved for them only with sexual abstinence. Ignorance was, has been, and always will be in that way. What is most grievous in this matter is that still in this day and age, not only monks but also many pseudo-occultists and pseudo-esoterists exist, who are convinced that only with sexual abstinence the problem of their intimate self-realization is resolved. Formidable evolutions are within the sperm, yet there are also tremendous devolutions. For instance, the natural process of development of the sperm is evolution in itself, since the sperm is the final outcome of what we eat and drink. It is also necessary to know that the evolutions of the sperm are submitted to the fundamental sacred cosmic law of the Heptaparaparshanak, which is the law of the Holy Seven, the Septenary Law. When the N. Seminus, the sperm, has completed its septenary evolutions, then it must receive an external Ecuador organ. Many millions of years have passed since the terrifying night of the past, in which we began slowly evolving and devolving. Yet, the human being still does not know who he is, where lie comes from, nor where is he going to. A lethargy of many centuries weighs over the ancient mysteries, yet, the verb still awaits at the bottom of the ark for the instant of its realization. Behind the Edenic tradition, there is a terrible cosmic desideratum and sacred errors which frighten and horrify. The gods also make mistakes. Thus, today, as all times, we are confronting our own destiny. We face the psychological dilemma of, to be, or not to be. Much has been said about the sacred serpent, yet, now we are going to clearly talk about the Kundar Tigwador organ. All of the efforts made by prophets, avatars, and gods in order to end the harmful consequences of the Kundar Tigwador organ have been in vain. It is necessary to know that the Kundar Tigwador organ is the negative development of the fire. This is the descending serpent, which precipitates itself from the coccyx downwards towards the atomic infernos of the human being. The Kundar Tigwador organ is the horrifying tale of Satan, which is shown in the body of desires of the intellectual animal, who in the present times is falsely called man. What is worst, their existential bodies of the being cannot succeed in getting the divinity or the being to operate or incarnate in them. However, they are able to liberate their essence so that it will fuse with their being and participate in his ecstasy. In the state of ecstasy, we can study the great mysteries of life and death. We have to study the ritual of life and death until the celebrant, the inner self, the being, arrives. It is only in the absence of the I that one can experience the bliss of the being. Only in the absence of the I can ecstasy be attained. When one achieves the dissolution of the mental mechanism, then comes that which the Oriental race calls, the breaking of the bag, eruption of the void. Then there is a shout of joy because the essence, the Buddhata, has escaped from within the battle of the opposites, and it now participates in the communion of the saints. Only through the experience of the ecstasy can we know what the truth and life is. Only in the absence of the I can we enjoy the joy of life and its movement. Only in the state of ecstasy can we discover the deep significance of the nativity, which every year we always celebrate with jubilation in our hearts. When in the state of ecstasy we study the life of Christ. Then we discover that a great fragment of this cosmic drama represented by the Lord remains unwritten. We must practice daily Gnostic meditation, it can be practiced alone or in a group. 38. Of our mind. The mind has many levels and profundities. 
If we have not comprehended a defect in all the levels of the mind, then we have done nothing, because the defect continues existing. As a tempting demon in the bottom of our own subconsciousness. 26. When a defect is integrally comprehended in all the levels of the mind, then it is disintegrated along with the small I which characterizes it. Thus, the defect is reduced to cosmic dust in the suprasensible worlds. This is how we die from moment to moment. This is how we establish a permanent center of consciousness, a permanent center of gravity within ourselves. The Buddhata, the interior Buddhist principle, the psychic material or the prime matter in order to build that which is called soul, exists within every human being who is not in an extreme state of degeneration. The pluralized I stupidly wastes such psychic material in absurd atomic explosions of envy, greed, hatred, fornication, attachment, vanity, etc. This psychic material is accumulated within ourselves in accordance with the death of the pluralized I, from moment to moment. Thus, we attain a permanent center of consciousness. This, is how we individualize ourselves little by little. When we rid ourselves of ego, then we become individualized. However, we didactic in order to dissolve the I. The best didactic for the dissolution of the I is found in practical life that is intensely lived. Conviviality is a marvelous full-length mirror, where the I can be contemplated in its entirety. The defects which are hidden in the bottom of our subconsciousness spontaneously emerge when we are in relationship with our fellow man. The defects burst out from us. Because our subconsciousness betrays us, and if we are in the state of alert perception, then we see them, just as they are in themselves. The greatest joy for the Gnostic is to celebrate the discovering of some of his defects. A discovered defect becomes a dead defect. When we discover any defect, then, we should see it in action, as when one is seeing a movie, yet, without judging or condemning it. To intellectually comprehend the discovered defect is not enough. It is necessary to submerge ourselves into profound interior meditation, in order to comprehend the defect in other levels of our mind. The mind has many levels and profundities. If we have not comprehended a defect in all the levels of the mind, then we have done nothing because the defect continues existing as a tempting demon in the bottom of our own subconsciousness. 26. When a defect is integrally comprehended in all the levels of the mind, then it is disintegrated along with the small I which characterizes